The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. BronxNet. Your voice, your views, your vision. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. A decade ago, through the deliberations on where to site the Croton Water Treatment Plant, Bronx residents, including frankly the host of this program, insisted that putting this industrial facility under the Marshall Golf Course in Van Cortlandt Park was a bad idea for many reasons. And now, years later, as the city's largest ever public works project nears completion and the third, yes, third, federal corruption conviction of a contractor on the project has hit the news. There are still controversies over numerous aspects of the plant, not the least of which is the $3 billion price tag that has caused historically high water rates for all New Yorkers. There are concerns about reneged parks funding promises that were part of the agreement to build the plant in the Bronx. Also ongoing questions about community access to the Jerome Park Reservoir the plant's viability in case of emergency, and remarkably, lately, there's even been raised a question of the need for the entire plant itself. Tonight's guests sit on a community filtration plant monitoring committee, and many of their concerns that you will hear tonight will be exclusive to this program. Our phones are open, so if you'd like to weigh in with your own questions or comments, you can call 718-960-7241. You can also email comments to us at bronxtalk at hotmail.com and we'll read those on the air during a future edition of our program. For now, in the studio, he sits as the chair of the aforementioned Croton Filtration Facilities Monitoring Committee. He doubles as the chairman of Community Board 8 in the Northwest Bronx, Robert Fernuzzi. Good evening, Mr. Fernuzzi. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. And also a monitoring committee member who is also the chair of Community Board 12. In the Northeast Bronx, it's Father Richard Gorman. Good evening. Welcome back to the program. Good to see you again, Gary. Hello, Bob. Oh, How you doing? Always nice to have both of you. Uh, gentlemen, let's uh, start with you, Mr. Um, Fanuzzi. Schlesinger Siemens Electrical, a company mm. that was controlled by a German elect uh, engineering conglomerate, Siemens AG, uh, got a $200 million contract to, to do the electricity for this huge plant. And it turned out they didn't even have a master electrician. Um, they also pretended that they used minority uh, suppliers when they didn't. And uh, then uh, they were found uh, by the uh, uh, Manhattan DA and uh, other investigators to say, well, wait a minute, you can't do that. It took many years to come up with it. They were fined uh, $10 million. However, having said all that, and I'm going to throw you the question, um, according to the Times, the settlement was worked out, so the company was not tossed out of all city contracting, but it was worked out so they could continue to work in the city of New York and receive contracts from the city. What does this say to you, and what are the implications of what we have going on here? I'm afraid it sounds like the cost of doing business, um, at least from the Siemens side, um, because they are still having an open contract with the filtration plant, and um, they have settled, and that money will go to New York City. Um, and that money, by the way, um, $10 million, $10 million um, will go into the coffers of New York City. Um, we have no guarantee that it will ever be spent on anything in the Bronx. Frankly, that fine represents money that was taken from the people of the Bronx for those two higher expense issues that you just raised. One was to have a master electrician, and second was to have women and minority contractors. Both things didn't happen. Now, they got that contract at a higher rate with the promise to have both those features. They didn't happen. So that money, the difference between what they actually spent and that higher price tag disappeared. So, you know, why does that happen? How does that happen? You have a city agency, the Department of Environmental Protection, that 
of, uh, is responsible for the project. They hired Anderson Steer, which is a, um, uh, a an oversight group, a, a group that was supposed to uh, uh, make sure that you know an integrity monitor, as it were, and. You know, yet this just simply happened right under our noses. Well, Any thoughts? You, 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 put it, you put the nail on the head. They've outsourced compliance. Um, they used a contractor to speak to a subcontractor to deal with oversight and compliance. Um, at no point did DEP ever step forward and either say um, to the city, this is what happened and uh, we are liable. Um, or to the filtration plant either uh, to have a statement to us and say this is what happened and um, this happened under our watch. Those things didn't happen because the chain of accountability as you described is very long. Uh, Father Gorman, your thoughts on this whole scenario? I know you've been um, involved in this for many years. Well Gary, you know, um, it gets to a point where you're almost numbed in your mind when you hear yet another aspect of the scandal involving this plant, which is a scandal in and of itself. But I think one of the problems that we see in this plant is that apparently we're dealing with firms, I guess to borrow a term from Michael Moore, are too big to fail. There are only certain firms that can undertake these projects. Indeed, I think when they conceive of some of these projects, they know ahead of time exactly what firms they're going to be going after. And so therefore, they really can turn around and adequately put the foot on these firms when they do something wrong because they know they don't have any alternative to turn to. Well, what should have happened here? What should have happened? Let's just say, it, you know, gee whiz, we made, you know, thinking the best of it, we've made a mistake. We've got this company that has the contract. We have now discovered they don't have a master electrician. We have an integrity monitor. We'd like to think they were involved in overseeing the contract and they knew right away this was a, a problem. What should have happened instead of going seven years and letting them play out the contract and do the work even though there was a problem? What would you have rather seen that? Well, Gary, I guess the best way to answer that is to tell you a story from my own experience dealing with the city. Um, at one time when I was parish priest in Woodlawn, I had a contract with the Youth Services Division to run a summer program for kids. And every other week a monitor showed up from DYS to make sure that everything was exactly as it was. And the one time that a monitor found something amiss, the funding was immediately cut off. It seems to me if the city of New York would do that with me for a lousy $10,000 for a $3 billion plus project, they should have had monitors out there. And the monitors should have been from the city, not an outsourced company. One of the things I'm wondering about at this point is what's going to happen to the company to whom the monitoring was outsourced? Right. What kind of penalty did they pay for not effectively and efficiently doing their job. And will the city of New York be using them again? Two questions that need to be answered. Right. Well, that, I was just about to pose that question to your colleague, uh, Mr. Fanuzzi, from your perspective, what should happen with this electrical firm? I mean, I uh, uh, articulated that basically, according to the way the Times described it, rather than just say, you guys are out of here, they basically said, well, you know what, we want to figure out a way that you, continue, you can continue to work. What should happen at this point if you had your druthers with this electrical company? Well, we need the DEP to step forward and take responsibility for their contractor, its work and its contract, and its ability to actually uh, comply. So they need to tell us um, this work is safe, and we've double-checked it, and we brought a master electrician in to make sure all this is in compliance with the codes. Um, secondly, they need to say, we are responsible now, um, and not outsource accountability to a third party that we've never known about. If there wasn't this chain, we may have known from DEP much earlier that there was a problem and we would have worked with them and been happy for the candor. When this subject came up during uh, one of those uh, monitoring committee meetings, which it did apparently the last meeting, I have attended many of them, I was not there that night. What was the response it, to the uh, DEP? I, I'm shocked that it would never come up before this and I had to bring it up. It was not on and the because it Because it was in the newspaper and you were The like, only hey, way I this? knew about it was that it was in the New York Times and that the district attorney released a statement that was incredibly informative. At that point, I was the most informed person in the room. There was no statement from DEP to go silent on this at a And public what was their reaction when you brought it up? They had no comment. Uh, Father Gorman, uh, one of the deputy commissioners, Mark Lanigan, has been uh, sitting on this committee, I mean, I, I have been there many times, people have all been there, you've certainly been there. 
But uh, is it curious that he was not at this meeting? And then what we're understanding is now all of a sudden they will not meet every month and they're now going to a three or four month schedule. And uh, uh, at least of what I understand, he's no longer going to be their representative, if that's accurate. Well, again, not trying to make any kind of personal uh, uh, attack upon Mr. Lanahan. The fact of the matter is he hasn't been very helpful being at the meeting. So maybe at this stage of the game, his absence is a blessing. But having said that, the fact of the matter is that I don't know whether or not it has anything to do precisely with this issue, Gary, but I think it's part of the overall attitude of DEP that basically has said to us that we don't have a right to ask the people who use our money to build things supposedly for us what's going on. Uh, gentlemen, I, I want to uh, bring on uh, Assemblyman Jeff Dinowitz, who has also uh, been a, a fierce opponent for this project, and he uh, joins us on the phone. I think he's up in Albany now. Assemblyman, are you with us uh, this evening? I am with you. Good. I, I don't know if you've heard the discussion. We were talking about the allegations. Or they, they're no longer allegations. They're uh, actually a conviction so of fraud. Um, you had experience with the Department of Investigations, who, at least according to the DA, uh, was credited with uh, kind of helping to find this out. But at least according to what your experience has shown, the DOI, the city's DOI itself, the Department of Investigations, is at least the suggestion you've made over the years is compromised. Explain to me what happened with you and the Department of Investigations as regards the, the DEP and the filtration plant. Well, several years ago, I went to the Department of Investigation because we want somebody to look into the massive incompetence and possible corruption uh, with respect to the plan. And when I got to the meeting with top officials at the Department of Investigation, lo and behold, Deputy DEP Commissioner was present at the meeting, the very subject uh, of, of the discussion, and they were there. It would be like if you wanted to report a crime to the district attorney and they had sitting in the room the person who committed the crime. It was unbelievable, unheard of, and it, it suggests to me that the, the city never really intended to do anything about the massive cost overrun and the um, corruption that may have taken place. That neither the DEP nor the mayor have ever acknowledged that there's a problem, let alone taken responsibility for it. So, so I this, have in little this, or no faith in the Department of Investigations So to in really this do what they need to do here. In this particular case where uh, uh, there are still allegations of, of ongoing fraud and, and other issues, um, are you satisfied with the DA's report that, that frankly praised Anderson Steer and the Department of Investigations as helping to root out the problems in this plan? And if not, what do you recommend that they do ultimately uh, with this project and with the study of what's going on here? Well, I, I'm, I'm not satisfied with the report. Um, it seems to me that any entity that's engaged in corruption should not get off with a slap on the wrist. We're talking about taxpayer dollars here. And for them to be able to pay a fine, and it may seem like a lot of money to us, but in fact it's a cost of doing business to them, and then they keep going about doing their business. Uh, and this has happened not only with this company, but with other companies that have a contract for the filtration plant. They have been found guilty uh, of fraud in other cases. And they were still allowed to have city contracts. And when I brought that up at the uh, monitoring committee meeting, uh, the DEP person said, well, no, that's, we can't do anything about that. We can't prevent them from uh, having city contracts. That's ridiculous. If somebody commits a crime, they should not be then making a profit from the city afterwards. Right. Um, Assemblyman, we're going to, if you want to hold on, we're going to talk about some other issues, but we do thank you for joining us and appreciate your comments. Um, one of the things that has come up um, is the idea of a federal investigation. Do you think that that's something that ought to be done uh, further, or at this point, uh, you know, let it go, let them finish the plant, and that's the end of it? I think there needs to be a federal investigation, considering the fact that we don't seem to have any other avenue, at least in the city of New York, to really pursue everything that has to be done here. Let's uh, stay on the telephones and go to Mark from Pelham Parkway, who called in. Mark, how are you tonight? Mark, are you with us? Yes, I am, Gary. Okay, what you got? As you know, I was involved with this a couple of years back. I have uh, one thing to say. Mm -hmm. I don't know why the politicians are still being around. Maybe we need a federal investigation. Maybe we should do this. This stinks from the very beginning when it mushroomed from 1.25 to 1.2 billion to 3 to 4 billion. Now you have the actual corruption 
and they're smacking hands. If you're waiting for the city or the state to even do something, the politicians that are behind this are just as corrupt, in my opinion, as the ones. This should be not we think we need, maybe we need. That's scratching your rear end. What they need in this is a federal investigation, and it goes back to the mayor when the mayor got involved, in, because this is $3 billion of our tax money, and not to mention all the water rates that have been going up unnecessarily for something that should have been done in Yonkers. Mark, yeah, this is so much. corrupt, it's ridiculous already. Actually, it wasn't Yonkers, it was Eastview, but the, we understand well, what you're you know, saying. But, but what I'm I, saying is, I think enough of maybe, maybe, maybe. There's no more maybes. We know it's corrupt. We know it. the whole thing stinks. Right. And it's time that we not we do something seriously about it. Well, that, if that isn't Bronx talk, I don't know what is. Thank you very much, Mark. <laughs> Mr. Panuzzi, you yeah. look like you had a reaction to something you heard there. Um, yeah, I think that one of the things that came up was um, in talking about another issue at our recent meeting, the um, lack of a backup generator. Okay, it was going to be um, my next question. Okay, so good. You practically could be the host of the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was fascinating to hear the defense of why we don't have backup generators at Croton. Um, an example of what happens when public officials speak with candor and honesty. And we will be fine as a city if, God forbid, this plant ever goes offline due to catastrophic weather or power outage. According to what they told According so to DEP. Let me just recount for viewers. What, what was discovered is that after Hurricane Sandy, of course, everybody's evaluating all our backup plans. Apparently, this $3 billion project is being constructed without a backup generator, one would wonder about the legality of it. So you raised it, and once again, the answer was? The answer was that we are covered by two other water sources that are not electrical in nature, that are gravity fit. Um, and that, therefore, not only did we learn that the city could survive without the filtration plant, but also that the water in the reservoir itself um, is raw. And will never raw meaning it's just coming from its source yes, and not being treated is not drinking water. Um, so these are two magnificent descriptions of the purpose and the system and the entire in industrial infrastructure that you describe that really strike at the heart of um, Bronx people's trust. In yeah. This. Well, in other words, why did we do this in the beginning? If and, and certainly do it to the extent of spending three billion dollars tearing up a, a parkland and everything else. Um, Father Gorman, um, your thought about that. I mean, do, do we need this plant? We know that the uh, federal government uh, required us to build the plant. Um, looking back, based on the answer you heard at that meeting, was it the right thing to do? Well, Gary, as you know, I go back at least 15 years on this issue. And I, I don't want to get into an argument with that fellow from Pelham Parkway <laughs> because he sounds tougher than, than I am. But, <laughs> Uh, originally, the plant was only supposed to be three quarters of a billion dollars. So uh, now we're three billion dollars over yeah, that. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is that I was never in favor of the plant. I've said that any number of times on your on your show. Said it down at City Hall. Uh, I go back to our former borough president, good friend Freddie Ferrer, who said quite bluntly that the way to go was filtration avoidance. And once we start talking about building a filtration plant. It's going to wind up in the Bronx and most likely in Van Cortlandt Park. And somehow he was right on the, uh, on, the, on the target with that. Let's get into this reservoir thing. And you actually had toured the Jerome Park Reservoir, which is right nearby where this uh, uh, TV studio is. Um, they, they had mentioned, as I understand it wasn't there, uh, that a contractor is cleaning the north and south basins. Um, the, the question was, why clean out the... Uh, uh, the basins of the reservoir, if the water is not going to be there till next fall, because uh, one would think they'd be needed to clean again, be cleaned again. And the answer was that the water would be raw water, and that's what Mr. Fanuzzi said, not potable drinking water. If that's the case, how should that affect uh, the, the community's ability to be able to traverse around the reservoir or turn it into a park right. and move it around? Because they've been basically saying you can't do it because this is a, you know, a highly sensitive area for the drinking water. Treated or untreated water, Gary, there's no reason why the people of this community, the people of the entire Bronx, the people of Southern Westchester and the entire city cannot in some way enjoy recreation at that reservoir. We certainly have the technology. All we need is the willpower and the political forthrightness to turn around 
and to create a, a situation where that can take place? Well, there was a press conference, if you're looking for political uh, pull, the borough president and uh, all the local elected officials around the area had said, you know what, we, re we really want yeah. access to it. So I think the political will is there. Why do you think, and I don't know if either of you can answer this, if it's an answerable question, why do you think that if, in fact, the, the city knows that there's no um, uh, filtered water in there, uh, and that really there doesn't appear to be a reason why the community can't get around it. Why do you think they have created this kind of don't touch this area, keep the people away from this yeah. area? Do you have it's a sense it's, it's become heavily policed, um, and it's a tragedy because at one point DEP sat side by side with you and other neighborhood advocates who really saw the future of this area for recreation, another central park in which you would have the same advantage of Manhattanites circling the perimeter of Jerome Park Reservoir. And at the time that DEP uh, planned a re um, filtration plant, the reservoir was very much in their mind. Commissioners actually sat on neighborhood conservancy boards. Um, and I am just struck how badly the relationship has gone since we broke ground for the filtration plant. At this point, the security argument has been vacated. There's no security risk to drinking water, by definition, by having access so to that inner So it would be, in roadway. essence, the same as a reservoir like the Central Park Reservoir, that it's, it's lovely, it's used... Uh, it's a holding a, tank. It's a holding tank. And DEP, by the way, has also invested millions of dollars in recreational facilities in Kensico and Westchester. Um, and I wish they would take this, our own reservoir in the Bronx, as seriously. The uh, memorandum of understanding that uh, was part of the, in fact, was the, the foundation of the agreement. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg was at St. James Park announcing this agreement that uh, the city was going to be building the filtration plant, and in exchange, the borough of the Bronx was going to get uh, landmark funding for parks improvements. According to that agreement, and I think we've documented it on this show in the past, um, those improvements had to be completed within five years because if you're going to do it, then you really want to change the nature of parks and have the people of the Bronx get something. As I understand, there are still nine parks in construction uh, and 12 are in design and we're well past the five-year mark. Right. Um, give me a, kind of the, the, the picture of where we're at with this parks funding and does it indicate to you that somebody reneged on a deal? As um, I suggested at the top of the show. I don't see any reneging. I just see the usual delays. Um, I see 20 projects still in the pipeline, eight under construction, 12 in design. The value of those improvements erode with inflation, as you know, and you've brought that up, and I, I totally agree with that. But I don't sense any um, ill will in the ability of parks or the inability of parks to get these projects off the ground. So I, it's not ill will is what you're saying? No. What is it? inefficiency and backlog mm -hmm. and understaffed. I, I will say, and then we'll ask Father Gorman a similar question, I will say that when I brought up a similar question that I just asked you at a, uh, a facilities monitoring committee meeting, the, the Bronx Parks Commissioner said, well, maybe it was unrealistic to begin with to think that we could have you know, spent the $250 million in uh, parks right. improvement. Right. Uh, thoughts from you, uh, Father Gorman, on this idea of the parks projects not being completed? Well, I think Commissioner Ponte was uh, being quite honest with us. <laughs> they knew from the very beginning they couldn't do this, but again, I think when the city decides to go ahead and do something, they turn around and they make it sound like it's the perfect solution to every conceivable problem, and they really entice people in by giving them false hopes and they give them false promises, and we find out time and time again that they're unable realistically to meet their promise. There has been this discussion of a pedestrian bridge, which um, the, the city claims was never part of the original agreement. And um, uh, so uh, for you, Mr. Fanuzzi, what's the status of that? That would be a bridge that goes over the Deegan and would kind of link up park areas in, in the North Bronx would probably be a very nice thing to have but apparently uh, there are no plans to build it. Was it a real promise? And uh, is there money out there uh, to, to build it or is all the uh, parks money spent? Well, I have a place where we could get that $10 million, but I think we've already covered that in the first so you're comment saying of that, our show. that the fines potentially could go right toward that. Yeah, we cover it beautifully. Um, there was an agreement between the city council and the um, um, state of New York to fund a series of uh, parks improvements um, to the tune of $47 million. And one of the things that agreement created 
was um, our committee. So we are answerable to the city council and we're a creature of the city council. All of those things have been actually satisfied except the pedestrian bridge. So the pedestrian bridge was proposed um, by parks advocates and agreed to by the city council and the mayor's office when they signed. So at this point, it is not funded by DEP or by the city of New York. It is the one outstanding parks improvement that to this day is orphaned. If, that, that is not on the list. Let, we've said that some of the other projects have not been completed. This one is not even no, on the list. This has no funding. There is a, and I don't, again, Father Gorman, I, don't, I know it's in his district, but there is a jogging path that has been funded and apparently designed to go around part of uh, the reservoir, but they haven't even broken ground for it. One would have thought that's the area most affected by uh, the filtration plant why not break ground and get started? What is the delay on that? Do you know? Do you well, my first response to that is why do you expect a logical explanation from <laughs> people, people who continually act rather crazily? Uh, the fact of the matter is, Gary, I think that essentially DEP and the city of New York are all, in terms of everything connected with this rather sad episode, has, has had one apparent attitude, and that is we do it our way as we want to do it, and the community be damned, and that's exactly what has happened. Uh, we're almost out of time. I'm going to let each of the three of you, including the assemblymen, have a last word. What do you think should happen now? At this stage of the game, I think the plan should be finished. I think there should be a thorough investigation by the federal government to see why there were cost overruns, the corruption that might have taken place, and if corruption has taken place, that those responsible are properly fined, and if anyone responsible but having been involved in corruption works with the city of New York. They shouldn't be in the future. Do you agree with that or you have anything to add or you're okay? I want let, let good government take its course. Restore the trust between the people of the Bronx and the city by its ability to make sure all the truth is out. And lastly, bring those public lands back to the people of the Bronx as soon as possible. Uh, Assemblyman, can you be quick? I don't know if you can on this particular subject, but do you do have, have a final <laughs> word on it? Not, not, not only is the plan probably the greatest monument to corruption and incompetence that the city has ever seen, but certainly there should be an investigation not only into the incompetence, not only into the overruns, but into the very decision that was made to cite the plan in the first place to encourage the park. But that's really where the corruption started, in my opinion. Uh, Assemblyman uh, Jeff Dinowitz, thank you for calling in from Albany. Uh, Chair of Community Board 8, Robert Fanuzzi, thank you. And Chair of Community Board 12, Father Gorman, thank, thank you. Thank you. And uh, folks, we're almost out of time. They're telling me, go quickly, go quickly. I'll just tell you, we've got four really good shows coming up uh, through the month of February. Uh, let's see, let me just get it right here. So uh, next week, uh, we will be doing uh, Sace del Sur, which is a wonderful photography exhibit. The week after, we'll study the Sheridan Expressway. Is it coming down? Is it not coming down? What should be there? The week after, we'll talk to you about protecting your family uh, with uh, cybersecurity. And the week after that, on February 25th, it is uh, Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz, Jr. Thanks to our uh, director, Shirley Arrieta, a Lehman Lightning uh, graduate, as a matter of fact. And uh, all the others, uh, Jane, of course, our producer, and everybody else who has uh, worked on the show. And to you for that.